In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, one God, Amen. My beloved, today is the third week of the blessed month of Abib, and the familiar gospel that we know very well is the gospel of the feeding of the five loaves and the two fish. And we said the month of Abib focuses on how the Lord supports those who minister to Him. And again, all of us are His ministers. The Christian responsibility is to share the message of the good news of the gospel to the whole world. We're not Christian just simply to save ourselves, but to save, you know, the whole world. And if we look around us, we see, you know, the world is in need of the gospel message. And contrary to popular belief, we believe that maybe everybody has heard the gospel and every under everybody understands it like we do. But this is very far from the truth. Many people, they have received an idea of Christianity that is not accurate and true. So part of our responsibility is to share this message with the whole world. The Lord sent His disciples out to preach and to heal the people. Um, and when they came back, this is what the Lord said to them, this, uh, this incident about feeding the five loaves. He first took them to a private place and He was going to speak with them. Then the multitude followed Him until it was late in the evening. And then He told His disciples, to feed them. Um, although the Lord Jesus, during the, that whole day, He was preaching to them and He fed their spirits, um, He also wanted to feed their bodies as well. Because again, He's the sustainer of life, the sustainer of everyone, both in spirit and in body. If the Lord simply wanted to feed them in a manner of just like fulfilling their, their need for hunger or for food, he would have allowed the disciples to go and get provisions and just feed them. But I believe there's a deeper meaning here than just simply feeding them with food to fill their bellies. Uh, the Lord, I think, desired to show the people the work of the disciples or what the work of the church is going to look like. A group of people sitting 50 by 50 gathered together around the Lord Jesus Christ and the disciples ministering to the people what the Lord had blessed. This should ring a bell, you know, to us all. Of course, this alludes to the idea of the divine liturgy. If we look here, all of us gathered together, we are gathered here around the Lord Jesus Christ, and, uh, and we all are sitting, you know, in different sections of the church, and then we come to partake of a food offered to us by the Lord. So what are the significant parts of this miracle that allude to what we're celebrating today in the Divine Liturgy? You know, the Greek word for liturgy is liturgos, right? Or liturgeia. Um, and it comes from two words. Laos is for people, and then ergon, which is work. So the word liturgy simply means the work of the people, something we do together. This is why when you look at the, um, the text of the Divine Liturgy, there's the priest part and the deacon part for, for those who are serving inside, and then the congregation. The congregation is not meant just to be the deacons here, but all of us, because it's a work of the people. We all participate. And you know, in the rites of the church, in order for there to be a liturgy to begin with, you need the priest, at least one priest, a deacon, and somebody in the congregation. So you need a representative of each of those to celebrate a divine liturgy. The first thing we notice here is that the Lord wants us to gather together. He wants us to gather together in a place to worship together. And to be, uh, um, and to be in fellowship with one another. When we gather together, we find that uh, we are fed by the Word, like during the readings and the sermon, we're fed by the Word of God. Just as the Lord did on that day, He fed them by teaching them the word, His words, right? And then we also, He wants to feed us His body and blood. So after we listen to the Word and we're in our, our souls are nourished, then our bodies will be nourished by partaking of uh, the divine body and blood of the Lord Jesus. And lastly, when we gather together, He wants us to be in fellowship with one another. To feel and to experience that the brother or my sister sitting next to me is in communion with me. We all partake of the same you know, body. Right? Abuna breaks off, he doesn't get many of them, and everyone takes his own. No, but we pray over one, and each of us gets a small piece of that body and a small piece, 
or a small portion of the blood. The gathering together also is very significant in our spiritual life and our life in general. When we gather together, this shows that we are united as one body and one church, and united in many ways. We're united in prayer. We're all praying for the same thing. When the uh, deacons or the abuna says, pray for the peace of the one holy Catholic and apostolic church, then it's our responsibility as a congregation to pray for the peace of the world together. You know, and that way when, the, when all of us are saying the same prayer together, it ascends to heaven like a pillar of fire. We also, it's unity in spirit uh, and unity in worship. All of us now when we pray, including Abuna, we face the east. And when you go home to your homes and you all pray in your rooms, we face what? We face the east. So although we might not be physically together when we're in our homes, but we're still united in prayer when we all face the same direction. We all pray from the same Egbeya together. Again, this is a display of our unity. And we all are united in service. Also, the gathering together doesn't, also, doesn't only unite us, but it also encourages us. How many of us, you know, if you think about, you know, let's maybe stay away from Good Friday, because maybe no one can stay in the room and pray for nine hours, right, or eight hours. But how about just the time we spend on Sunday? How many of us can spend this two and a half hours in the room by themselves praying? I can't, right? It's difficult. But when we gather together, we can do it together. When we gather together on Good Friday, when you're praying eight hours in a day or nine hours in a day, it's very difficult to do on our own. But when we gather together in unity, we can. Also, it encourages us to serve. When we gather together, we can see and feel the needs of our brethren and find ways to fulfill those needs. Um, and then we see how our brother and sister serve. So you say, you know what? This is beautiful how this person is serving. I want to try to serve like this person is serving. Also, the gathering together helps support, support us. You know, we support one another when we gather together in one body. Um, and we all face different challenges in life and different struggles in life. But when we gather together, we can share sometimes, of course, with those who are close to us, we can share with those struggles with each other and help encourage each other and maybe give some advice in the, in the time uh, of need. Um, there was a time when St. Peter was put in prison in Acts chapter 12. And he was waiting because St. James was just martyred um, and it was his turn. So he was waiting in prison for the next morning for him to be martyred. And he was sleeping in prison. And then what does scripture tell us? It tells us Peter was therefore kept in prison, but constant prayer was offered to God for him by the church. And what was the response to their prayer? Then an angel went to the prison of St. Peter, had to poke him to wake him up, freed him from his chains, and took him, to the, uh, took him out of the prison and to the gate of the city. And in the beginning, Peter thought that he was dreaming. But then he found actually he was out of prison and he was free. So we see the power of prayer of the church together when we pray together in unity. Um, the gathering also should be orderly. You know, if you listen to the, the gospel, it said he, the Lord told the disciples to have them sit down in groups of 50. He wanted them to be like in an orderly fashion, not chaotic, and everybody just come, you know, put their hand and take from the basket and go, and they're pushing and shoving. No. He said it should be orderly, 50-50. And they don't come. But we go to what? We will go to them and give them the food in these groups of 50. So the Lord instructed the disciples to have this order, right, when they distribute the food. In the same way, the church has its order. And this is because God is a God of order. It says, St. Paul says to the Corinthians, For God is not the author of confusion, but of peace, as in all the churches of the saints. So God is a God of order. So we ought to be cooperating with the order of the church because this is what's pleasing to God because he's a God of order. Imagine, I can't imagine, the people at that time when the Lord said, okay, put them in groups of 50 because he's going to feed them. I can't imagine the people saying, no, I'm not going to sit in this group. No, but they knew, okay, this person is our teacher, so we'll listen to him and we'll sit in these groups of 50. And because of their obedience, they received the blessing that the Lord had to offer to them. So the first thing we notice here is the importance of the gathering of the people together as we gather today to partake of the Eucharist together. The second thing we notice is the offering 
by the people. When we come to partake of the Eucharist, my, my beloved, there should be something that we're coming to offer to the Lord. Whether it's a monetary donation, whether it's a service, whether it's waking up early to pray, whether it's praying for somebody else, there must be something that I'm coming to offer to the Lord when I come to the liturgy this morning, uh, or every, every day. Um, and if you noticed, what did the Lord do? He said, you give them to eat. And then they said, we have no more than five loaves and two fish. So we have something very small. And if you look at these five loaves and two fish, amongst all maybe 20,000 people, this is insignificant, all right? What is this going to do? You know, if we even just, if we all smell it, it'll be consumed, right? But it, was, it seems very small. Sometimes we consider, okay, well, if I come to church and I just put a dollar or I just, you know, pick up a piece of trash when I see it in the church, we think that this is insignificant. But even the things that are insignificant, when they're placed in God's hand, what do they do? They become a source of blessing. These five loaves and two fish in the Lord's hand were able to feed, feed 20,000 people plus 12 baskets remaining. Because, and it seemed to be insignificant in the beginning. Do you remember the story of the widow who put the two mites? Right? She put the two mites and perhaps she thought to herself, this is insignificant to the hundreds of dollars or thousands of dollars that my neighbor is putting in. But she said, you know, this is all that I have. Let me give this to the Lord. And you know what the Lord said? He said, Assuredly, I say to you that this poor widow has put in much more than all those who have given to the treasury. Much more. So it seems like the Lord here is calculating things different than you and I. We calculate things in the monetary value. But he calculated things according to the sacrifice that each incurred when giving. The way said that the woman gave out of her poverty and gave all that she had. Meaning what? That she depended on the Lord for today and tomorrow's food because this probably was her uh, source of food. She was going to buy food with this. But she gave it. Sometimes we believe that even the small offering, the insignificant offering, is really insignificant, but it's not. Everything we offer to the Lord on the behalf of myself or my family or the people that I know is something that is significant. We are asked to offer to God these things, however little they may be. The third thing we notice is the blessing is from the Lord. Once the offering was placed in the Lord's hand, he blessed it. And it's only in his hand that it is blessed. Only in his hand that it is blessed. When it was in the hands of the young boy, it was only five loaves and two fish. When was it able to be you know, sufficient enough to feed the 20,000? was after the Lord had touched it and blessed it. The blessing of the Eucharist, my beloved, is transformative. It's our medicine. There are many people that maybe perhaps that you know that are like stay-home Christians. You know, they come to church once or twice a year, if even that, just on the feasts, and they don't even stay to take communion. If these are people that we know with and we deal with, we need to encourage them. The Eucharist is our medicine. It's the healing for our souls. How is it that the Eucharist heals us? I don't know. I can't tell you exactly how it does this, but it's transformative because we partake of his actual body and precious blood. And when we unite to him, he will transform us. And it's different for me and it's different for you. So I can't tell you exactly how this works. This is unlike regular food. Regular food, uh, we can calculate the effects it has on the body. We can say, okay, this kind of food has X amount of calories. And say, I need 2,000 calories in my diet for the day. Then if I stay underneath this 2,000 calories and I have a modest activity, what would we expect to happen to our body? We expect to lose weight, right? But if I consume much more than 2,000, right, then we can calculate and say, you are over an excessive amount of calories, so we can expect that we would gain weight. It's predictable. The food that we can consume, we can calculate and figure out what we need and what we don't need. But when it comes to the heavenly food, it's not something that's calculated. I can't tell you exactly how it happens or how it works, but it works because this is his precious body and blood. It is the blessing and the grace of our Lord that gives all things their increase. As St. Paul says, so then neither he who plants is anything nor he who waters, but God who gives the increase. It's God who gives the increase, right? If you remember the passage of uh, Moses, 
when he was with the multitude in the wilderness, and they told him, we're thirsty, give us something to drink. So he took his staff and he struck the, struck the rock. Was it the power by which Moses hit the rock that made the water come out? No, you can hit a, 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 a mountain or a rock as hard as you want with a, uh, with a sledgehammer. Water doesn't come out of rocks, right? But with the blessing of God, yes, the water came from the rock, right? The same thing with uh, Elisha and Naaman, right? Is it the Jordan that healed Naaman? Is it the waters of the Jordan that healed him? No. It was, first it was Naaman's, bless, Naaman's obedience, and then his blessing that he received for his obedience to Elisha. And he went and he, dunk, he dipped himself seven times in the Jordan, and he was healed. He received the blessing, right? Because it only comes from the hands of God. We can't receive the Eucharist anywhere else but church. This is why St. Cyprian, uh, one of the church fathers, he says there can be no church without the Eucharist. What are we coming to take? Are we just coming to listen? Or am I coming to partake and unite with Christ to be transformed? The fourth thing we find in this uh, passage of the five loaves and two fish is the meal is to be distributed by the disciples. It says he took the five loaves and two fish, looking up to heaven, he blessed them, broke them, and gave them to the disciples to set before the multitude. The Lord desires us to be fed this miraculous food by the hands of his disciples. In the same way, the Lord desires us to be fed the body and blood by the hand of the priests or the disciples or the apostles and their descendants, right? He, we can't get this from anywhere else. This is why there, if there's no apostolic succession in a church, the authenticity of the Eucharist they offer is not authentic because it has to come from the hands of the disciples. He could have said, and do, do you think the disciples were the strongest and most fit out of all of these 20,000? No. If the Lord is interested in somebody who is fit and strong and able to carry the baskets, I'm sure he could have chosen, you know, 12 or 20 other people who are far more physically fit and fit to distribute the food than the disciples. But he intended on having the disciples do it, even if they are frail or even if they are weak. And even if you look at only 12 people distributing to 20,000. Imagine, you know, if this church is all full, maybe you would say it's 500, right? 500 and one person giving communion to the 500, how long does this take? It takes a very long time, right? But imagine now feeding 20,000 people with only 12 people. That's going to take a really long time, right? But he still insisted that only they distribute. Not getting any more help because he's meant to send us a message that this meal is only to be distributed by his disciples. The last thing we notice is that nothing should be lost. Nothing should be lost. He said, so they ate all and were filled until baskets of the leftover fragments were taken up by them. He wanted nothing to be lost. And nothing from the body of the Lord and his blood should be discarded, but rather used. There should be nothing uh, even if they are left over. This is why you'll find at the end of the Divine Liturgy, if there's any of the body and the blood left, we consume it, right? Because there should be nothing, you know, left over. Yes, there is some always left over, but then we consume it, right? We take it. And some people meditate and say that these 12 baskets that were left over were for those who were working. So each of the disciples received one. As the Lord said, a laborer is worthy of his wages. This point turns to, or points us to, the value and sacredness of a thing. That which is so valuable and precious, we do not want to waste, but rather use every bit of it. We don't want to waste anything if something is very valuable. If you have an expensive, a really expensive kind of oil, for example, and you spent a lot of money on this oil to use for a special dish, we don't use this oil in insignificant meals, like making popcorn or something like this, but we use it only in this type of fine dish because it was expensive, right? So it shows the value when we want to preserve something and keep it, you know, it shows its sacredness when we don't want to waste it. Um, and look at, if we, Consider this same idea. Um, consider the, uh, the sacredness which is also used to care for the distribution of the mysteries. 
When we go to distribute the mysteries, what do we do? The, the body is covered, right, with uh, a veil, and Abuna carries it with all like respect and reverence and honor. And when he, we just, he turns around and he says, the body and precious blood, the deacon stopped chanting, and everyone says, what well, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, right? Again, showing this honor and reverence because it is sacred. <clears throat> And how is it that we approach to partake of this body and this blood? We come with a veil, right? To show the reverence. Lest anything fall as I'm partaking, I, care, I hold it with a veil. Why a veil? Because even we, we look and say, okay, I don't want it even, you know, to fall into my hands. As if saying that I'm unworthy, you know, to even carry it. Although, yes, we take it within us. So it's not the idea of the veil. But the idea is what? It shows reverence. And if you remember, after we had COVID, um, this is kind of a side note, we didn't use the veils for a while. And then after this, I began to insist, especially with the young ones, that they use the veil. Why? Because it shows reverence and honor to the body and blood. What would happen was what? I'd give them communion to maybe the young ones, and they begin to chew it as if they're chewing gum, with their mouth open and they're smacking. And it's very, it seems like it's, it's, it's not right. It's not fitting. But when you have the veil, what do you do? You cover your mouth, right? So I'm not talking to my neighbor, and I'm not you know, chewing it as if I'm chewing any kind of gum, right? But it gives it this honor and this reverence. <clears throat> so what are some lessons quickly we can learn from this? Number one is do not value the gathering uh, together in church. Um, gathering together is valuable for us in our spiritual life. There can be no church without the Eucharist, as I said. And we will not be alone in heaven if we think about it. Some people say, oh, I want to go and find a liturgy that is just me and a Buna and a deacon so I can pray. No. Heaven is not going to be like this. Heaven's going to be crowded. There are going to be many people there, many saints there. And we should want every one of our, the people in the world to be in heaven with us. So we shouldn't want to come to church and be by ourselves. All right? We, the, it's better when I come to church and I find everybody here. One, it's encouraging for me to pray. And then when I see my brothers and sisters repentant, partaking of the Eucharist and participating in worship, this ought to make me happy, right? Yes, maybe what comes with this is maybe some distractions and so on, but this is all of our struggle. Believe me, if you're by yourself in your room, you're going to struggle with distractions just like I do. <clears throat> Number two is uh, come with something to offer to the Lord. Ask yourself every day when I come, what am I coming to offer to the Lord? Am I offering a service? Am I offering some, something, some monetary offering? What am I coming to offer to Him? I have to come and give Him something so He can return this thing to me in blessing through the Eucharist. <clears throat> or is it that I only come to God to take? Do I only come to God to take? How many of us would be really close friends with somebody who only wanted to take from us? We would say, this person is just using me. Every time they call me, they want something. They never ask about how I'm doing. They're just using me. We don't, may not like this kind of relationship. What makes us think that God likes this kind of relationship? Number three is that all you do be done in the Lord and blessed by Him. Offer your work. Offer your play. Offer your service. Offer your speech. Offer everything to the Lord. <clears throat> This, that it may be used by him to be blessed by him and to be for the glory of his name. Lastly, work together so that no one is lost. We saw that nothing was lost in this miracle and uh, everything was collected again so that nothing was lost. Think of all of this like the people that were there. Everyone was fed and nobody was left hungry. So part of my duty as the example of the whole you know, miracle is, is that I should be serving my brother and my sister in the world. Can I serve my brother and sister in the world without loving them? No. Can I serve them while I make fun of them and slander them on social media? No. Can I save them when I hate them? No. Can I save them when I curse them? No. We have to reconcile. We have to learn, okay, to be a little bit thick-skinned, nefelwit, to forgive, in order to fulfill the Lord's will in saving 
all of the people of the world as much as we can. May God give us his grace and let everything we do be put in his hand, that it may be blessed and returned to us. To God be the glory forever and ever. Amen.